the ECG lab. So, um, so let me ask the potential. And here are different ash potential traces for uh, the heart. There are basically two that we'll look at. They're all kind of the same. But the two that kind of are the ones we should study are this one and this one. So, SA node. In these cells, they're the ones that have the pacemaker potential. They have other things too. Yeah, and I called them yesterday the autorhythmic cells. self-generate APs, okay? So we'll study that one, the SA node. We'll study the, the contractile cells of the ventricular muscle. So the, the muscle cells of the heart, I just call those contractile cells. Now, if you recall, well, let me ask you if you recall. Okay, which one of these two generate the tension to pump blood? The muscle ones. Yeah, those ones just self-generate the signal that spreads through the whole heart. So these cells make the whole heart contract. Okay, they're both important. But anyways, what, what I think is important for students to study is um, the, the currents that make these traces well, for this one and for that one. Sodium, calcium, potassium, and what's called this pacemaker current. Okay. So this is outlined by your books, and I think it'll be good to kind of use different colors to kind of symbolize which current carries which part of the ash potential trace. And we've all studied the ash potential in the neuron. Now we're just going to study it for, you know, these cells in the heart. So sodium current, let's do the first one. I'm going to use green. Um, the sodium current is responsible for depolarization of the ash potential in cardiac muscle cells. Okay, those are the contractile cells there. And then so, you know, a depolarization is when you get an influx of positive charge, like I said yesterday. And basically, how you read it in terms of millivolts, the inside of the cell becomes more positive with respect to the outside. So basically, um, I'll just draw um, and we have millivolts. Uh, maybe you have like zero, maybe you have negative 90, and, uh, but the polarization is just, you just shoot straight up. So that the depolarization in contractile cells is carried by sodium. Okay, so that's all I'm going to do. That, 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 that's all I want you to know for now. Um, Moving on, calcium current is responsible for the depolarization of the SA and AB nodes, and it also triggers muscle contraction. It delays repolarization in cardiac muscle cells. So there's a couple of things there. Okay, number one, we know that calcium will cause the depolarization of the autorhythmic cells. So how about I use red for calcium? And for calcium, it causes the polarization for autorhythmic cells. Go uh, zero. Uh, so basically, I'll just draw an up that, okay? 
and you're becoming more, you're depolarizing the cell. So it's carried by a different current. So what we see is that polarization of these cells is carried by calcium here, it's uh, or sodium. That's what I want you to see. But the other thing it said was calcium also delays repolarization in the muscle cells. All right. So the thing about the sodium channels, they inactivate really fast. So you, you start to see a repolarization. It starts to go down. But it kind of stops right there. It, doesn't it does not continue to repolarize to rest. It doesn't do that. Instead, there's an influx of calcium that delays the repolarization. So what really happens is calcium comes in and it kind of like causes this, they call this like how it kind of stays depolarized a little bit. They call that the plateau. And it's caused by calcium. So calcium also does that. I'm going to move on to number three. Uh, potassium current is responsible for repolarization of both cells. So I'll use blue. So it's going to repolarize this cell. It's going to repolarize this cell. Okay. Now, in both cells, when you're in the condition of rest, well, in this cell, um, usually the cell is most permeable to potassium, and it keeps it at negative 90. So, I'll, you know, when it's in rest, I'm just going to draw a line down here. <coughs> Call this. You know, we taught resting membrane potential. And in the muscle cell, this rest, the cell is mostly permeable to potassium. Now, do you remember if potassium leaves or enters the cell? Do you remember that? Leaves. Leaves, that's right. When a positive cation leaves the cell, it, it kind of makes the inside negative with respect to the outside. That's the condition of rest. So for this, what you see here, this whole thing is considered the action potential. I'm going to call it AP for short. As opposed to rest, the resting potential, which is negative okay. value. And notice um, one thing about the muscle cells in the heart. Remember that thing about graded potentials and threshold potential that you had to reach for the neuron? Mm -hmm. There's none of that there. You go straight from rest to depol because of the gap junctions. The signal spreads so easily, it just gets there and you get your action potential. So basically, there's no graded potentials. You know, there's no threshold potential. Because of the gap junctions, you just go straight to depolarization. Right. <laughs> little different for the uh, autorhythmic cells. They don't really have a resting membrane potential. As soon as they're uh, repolarized, uh, they'll automatically slowly depolarize to threshold. Let's say threshold is right here. Whatever it is, negative 40 or something. Uh, so when they, when they hyperpolarize, it's like, and this is mostly carried by a sodium current, um, they'll slowly depolarize to threshold, and they'll fire another action potential. Depolarize, repolarize. And as soon as they get the rest, they don't stay there, they're, they, you know, They'll just slowly depolarize the threshold and fire again. So this is the self-generating action potential we're talking about. And this slow depolarization of the threshold, this thing right here I keep drawing, they call that the pacemaker potential, just that part that reaches threshold. 
case maker potential. So when people say that, they're referring to that slow depolarization to threshold. A slow depole to threshold. It's mostly carried by a sodium current. Calcium may play a role too. Okay, I'm sure I'll throw that in there. I like to keep it simple, but I can't all the time. So sometimes sodium, sometimes calcium also plays a role in the pacemaker potential. Uh, so it's just a slow depolarization of the threshold. So distinguish pacemaker potential versus this or that. Those are the ash potential. Okay. The depole and the repole. So you can see the, the differences between the two. There are several. Now, any, any questions about this versus that? Yeah. During rest, yes. During rest. Oh, um, yes, that is true. Rest and repolarization, that is true. Oh, I, I, I <laughs> um, well, you know, I'm going to go through this again, and maybe when I go through it again, that'll uh, answer that as to why. Mo most excitable cells are mostly permeable to potassium to get that condition of rest. Because if you're an excitable cell, how are you excitable? You have to have this negative membrane potential at rest. So you can have a depolarization of it. And usually being permeable with potassium helps that. So. Well, anyways, let's talk about those contractile cells again. And what I want to do this time um, is study this figure. I noticed the book, they kind of dropped this. Um, but I still like to teach from it because we still want students to know how the currents here cause the membrane potential we observe here. And the other thing I like is that they include, it's a double y-axis, so they include a tension curve. So the student can see how tension is generated, uh, you know, with the ash potential there, as a result of all um, these currents. So um, I had to pick, like, well, which parts, which phase of the ash potential do I want to teach? So I kind of put the numbers here. And that'll kind of like um, cue me in on what you should know in terms of these um, channel types, okay? Sodium, calcium, and potassium. So I'm gonna, we'll, come, we'll come back to the autonomic cells, but we'll focus on that one for now. All right, well, um, let's start where I say phase zero. That's rest. Now, rest is, you know, right there. It, the membrane potential is negative 90. Oh. Yeah, they say it's about negative 90 here, too. So what I want you to see is look over here. Look at the, what the cell is permeable to. Now, my colors are different. Uh, I didn't match this. But they, they, they use green. And they use red and they use uh, yellow there. And so if you look where the zero is, this is relative permeability. I mean, just look. What is the cell most permeable to here? I mean, which, which line is the highest? The green line. The green line where the zero is. Is that the yellow? Well, yellow was here. I'm not at number one. I'm, I'm here. See how you read the graph? Right where the zero is, go, go up. Green is the highest, and then like yellow and red are right there. So basically what I'm trying to show students is during the condition of rest, the cell is most permeable to potassium. And that's why you observe the resting membrane potential of negative 90.
But if you move to like the depolarization phase, <laughs> you see a big spot, I put the number one right next to the big yellow spike. Uh, the sodium current is the most powerful current. Okay. And, um, Sodium current channels open, you basically overshoot equilibrium. The membrane potential, it should fall to zero. Zero would mean the cell is as negative and positive outside versus inside. It's all in equilibrium. It should stay there, but it's such a powerful current, you overshoot. Equilibrium looks like you go about to plus thirty. Okay. To plus thirty millivolts. So let's say that this top top mark is about plus thirty. You've overshot equilibrium there. Yeah. Now, the thing about the sodium channels is, you know, remember that inactivation gate? They have a rest. They have uh, two gates, and one of them is an inactivation gate. Go, go back and look that up quickly. What I'll just say for this lecture: sodium channels inactivate quickly. that chapter for the voltage gate to sodium channels. It's kind of a ball and chain uh, globular structure. And as soon as they open, they inactivate quickly. That ball and chain, it kind of like plugs it up. And we observe it on the action potential trace right there, where it starts to go down. Right? So let's call that sodium inactivation, sodium channel. Activation. So, and we, we see that on the yellow curve. As quick as it goes up, it like goes all the way back down. So, for you know, just a millisecond, the cell is extremely permeable to sodium and it just kind of plummets back down. So, um, that kind of like shuts off the sodium influx. Now what I had said about calcium is it has an ability to delay the repolarization. And that's very important for cardiac muscle, as we'll see. But for now, let me explain this. So where I put the number two, like right in the heart of where the cell is permeable to uh, calcium here. So there's a lot of things that happen uh, during this time here. So let me explain everything. So we have to remember um, the cellular structure in the cell membrane. Well, maybe there's a, a transverse tubule. In muscle, there's a sarcoplasmic particulum. I'll call it SR for here. Oh, sarcoplasmic. Reticulum and it's filled with calcium. Calcium is super important for muscle contraction. So remember, the red balls are going to be for calcium. My picture here is well, let's also remember that you have the striations, which are the organized contractile proteins for muscle whether it be cardiac or skeletal. So, you know, remember that? You guys studied the circle meal.
So I'll just kind of you know draw a circle. Yeah, there's all the contractile proteins that can generate the tension. So the thing is, the goal is you need to spill the calcium over this. And if you need to go back and look up cross bridge cycling just to remind yourself how calcium binds the troponin, it moves the tropomyosin, it exposes the binding site, you get the cross bridge formation, you get the head pivot, all that stuff. Well, we thought that in 4 3. That's why, you know, it's happening here too. So you need the calcium. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing about it is, there's a, like a trap door that's calcium sensitive. So pretend that this has a, um, a channel. Um, that's calcium sensitive. And it, it goes by different names. Uh, sometimes books call it the, the riatidine receptor. I think that term still might be used by your author. But this receptor is calcium sensitive, so let's call it riatidine uh, receptor or channel. It, it's the thing that, calcium is the thing that, it's kind of ironic. It holds calcium and it needs calcium to open it to spill more calcium. Okay. So the thing about it is, um, in addition to sodium channels in the cell, there's also voltage-gated calcium channels in the cell. So um, to delay the repolarization, let's call this number two, there's a lot of things that happen. The first thing that happens is there's a surge of calcium, of extracellular calcium that enters the cell. Call it a calcium surge. Of calcium surge of extracellular Pretend that calcium comes in and diffuses over here. You know, it's not enough. It's a little something stuff, but it's not enough to get the cross bridge cycling. But it is enough to open the floodgates on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So maybe this, this one will bind, and maybe that door will swing open. And then the floodgates happen, and um, the book uses, it, uses an interesting term called calcium sparks. When this calcium is liberated intracellularly, it's already in the cells, in the sarcoplasmic particular, then this calcium should be enough to get some cross bridge cycling. You saturate the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum there. So they, the term they use for this is calcium sparks. So I want you to distinguish it from calcium surge. Calcium surge is the extracellular calcium that the cell is permeable to. It's coming in. But it's enough to liberate the calcium from the uh, sarcoplasmic particulate. So I'll say release of calcium from SR, just so you, you know, don't get confused. Well, anyways, once you get that, then you'll get the cross bridge cycling and you'll generate maximum tension during this time. And, th and that's observed right here. You can see tension is building during this phase called the plateau. And the reason why you're not repolarizing is if you have an influx of a positive ion, you cannot repolarize, right? You're, you're going to remain. This basically is delaying repolarization. So both of these things delay the polarization. Okay. And the other thing that helps delay the repolarization is what's happening with the calcium, um, I'm sorry, the potassium channels. We've got one more channel in here.
cal um, potassium, it's like, it usually leaves, but it's all plugged up. I'll just draw that as a plug. Okay, look at where I put the, I put the number two on purpose where it's lowest, where the potassium permeability is the lowest and the calcium surging is the highest, okay, right there. So those are both happening at the same time. To keep positive in the cell, it delays the repolarization. That's very important. So let's call this, I call it the, just to put a name to it, the potassium plug. Potassium permeability is at its lowest during this number two part. So that's a lot of things happening. Let, let's recap. Calcium surge, calcium sparks. You delay the repolarization because, you know, because of this and because of the potassium plug. And the most important thing is you're generating max tension because you, you got the cross bridge cycling happening now. So let me add that somewhere. Generate max tension. So this is the pumping action, you know, this is, this is what the heart does, it generates pressure. It all happens during this plateau. So when I say delay repolarization, it's the same thing as saying plateau. Okay, so there's a lot of things going on uh, for number two. Yeah, you have any questions about all the events that happen intracellularly? Yeah. It's not going out. It's plugged. It's plugged. It's not going out. Keep positive in. No, positive's coming in. Keep positive in. That delays repolarization. That's the point. Okay. Now, any other questions? All right, good. So we've established that fact. This is why I, I, I pull my, if you were like, look at this, like the next day, like, what the heck is this? You have to like, you watch the video and look at the train of thought, right? I can relate to that. That's why it's good for this class to review your notes right after class. If you wait till tomorrow, you've forgotten everything. Well, then you can watch the YouTube video. Uh, okay, phase number three, right here. This is, um, I put this where you have uh, repolarization. So I'm going erase all this. at UC Davis and I took physiology, I had to ride my bike to the library right after class and rewrite my notes. It's the only class I had to do that for. And what's amazing is when you do that, I remember everything. I don't understand everything, but I recall everything. And that's the real reason why we suggest that to students. You'll recall 100%. And when you're rewriting your notes, you'll realize what you don't understand. But you recall everything. If you wait till tomorrow, the research says you forget 80%. And I think that's really true. Okay, all right, so for number three, we call that polarization. And so, um, just look at the events on the bottom slide here. The cell is not permeable to sodium. It's permeable, max perme uh, permeable to potassium, and it looks like you finally are not permeable to calcium. Okay, so the only thing you're permeable to is potassium, and you have an outward flux. So I'll just say potassium efflux. Polarizes membrane potential. So that's what you see here, I mean, you just return uh, to rest. So repolarization is this part of the curve, right? So basically you have depole on this side, and this side is repole. Re 
Slide on me. Everyone get a little half sheet there. Uh, we're over there. You can go. One, two, and three, people, auto, repole. And then I have all these events. And I want you to put one through six under the correct one, two, three. Got it? I'll give you a minute. Can we talk about it? Let's see if you follow that. Most things happen for number two. Just figure out which what, which is what. All right, let me help you along. What is that, Joe? But if I did include rest, you would be correct. And let's add one more thing to this. If I, I'm going to do this on the test. If I point to here, right there, where it starts to go down but doesn't, what do you call it? Same channel and activation. That's the other thing I want you to know. It's not on this list. Okay. Uh, so this figure also shows. Um, how long the actual potential is, about 0.3 seconds. You pull, re pull, but it shows another term here I want to introduce, which is why I'm teaching this whole thing. Uh, the refractory period. The refractory period is happening during, while the cell is in a state of contraction. That's a really important detail for the heart. Um, 
So let's go through that and why refractory period is important. And to show you the importance of refractory period in muscle, we'll compare cardiac to skeletal. And this is something um, commonly done in this chapter. This is data for skeletal muscle. So, for skeletal muscle, um, let me show you these data graphs here. We did teach this in 430, and uh, this is what I want you to remember. When you stimulate the muscle fiber, um, that's shown by the red action potential. Okay? And that stimulus actually, um, you get a twitch. Okay? Remember saying the muscle twitch? Now, the muscle twitch is not how muscle works, right? I mean, if your muscle's twitching in your body, that's not right. But, but this is how a physiologist studies muscle. You want to see how the tissue responds to one stimulus, one action potential. That's why we study the properties of it. So you see it takes time to build tension, and there's time for relaxation. The thing about refractory period is refractory period, refractory means a period of insensitivity. Cannot re stimulate the muscle during the factor. Cannot re stimulate during this time. You, you can, after that time, and notice how um, short the refractory period is. Let's, let's kind of table this out. Refractory period um, about contraction time. Let's kind of table that out for skeletal muscle. The refractory period is only like 10 milliseconds. They kind of like put it in that beige color for you. The contraction duration is, is um, quite long. It's about 100 milliseconds. So what I'm going, where I'm going with this is you could re-stimulate the muscle before, before it has time to completely relax. So, you know, in the experiments that we do in 430 where we kind of like re-stimulate, we want to see how the muscle responds. I mean, if you're a physiologist and you're studying muscle, you want to see what this thing is capable of. Right? So you just kind of re-stimulate before it has time to relax. So what they do is, the refractory period, they say, okay, I'm going to re-stimulate at 75, every 75 milliseconds, because you can. Or 75 milliseconds is right here. And this is time while the muscle is relaxing, but it's not completely relaxed. And what you observe, you know, every triangle is supposed to be a stimulus. You just kind of hit the frequency button there. What do you see? You build this tension, this wave summation, and you get this um, tetany, this smooth tension. Okay, the smooth maximum tension. That's how muscle um, works. Okay, so um, is tetany, you know, tetanic contraction. Is tetany possible? I'll ask that as a yes, no question. Yes, because you can re-stimulate because the refractory period is so short. Okay? And that's how skeletal muscle works when we study that. Now, what we're studying today, cardiac muscle, the data looks quite different. Okay, so uh, let's kind of look at this here. Because of that delayed repolarization, you have a much longer refractory period. 
the refractory periods for cardiac muscle. Something like 250. That means you cannot re-stimulate during that time. Look at the contraction duration. It's almost 250. I mean, it's a little longer. I don't know, we're going to call that 260. So if you did the same experiment, you stimulate one time, and then you get your single twitch curve. What happens when you try to re-stimulate, I don't know, every 75 milliseconds? What I've noticed is, OK, they stimulate here. These are very, they're trying to re-stimulate the muscle, but they gray it out. They're trying to show you you can't do anything. You can't re-stimulate because you're within the refractory period. So what do, what do you, what do you, we want students to observe? We want students to observe that the muscle has time to relax, so that when you can re-stimulate, you're not getting any kind of wave summation tendon. Okay, that's what you're supposed to see here. So, did you understand what I just said? Can you answer this question? Is it yes or no? No. no. Yeah, all right. No. And that's good for muscle, for cardiac muscle, because what's happening here is, do you remember how you have in the heart a period of systole? period of diastole. Yeah. So, period of systole, that's the pumping, right? But you have to have a period of diastole. So, by having tetany not be possible, basically, I think of it as the muscle has time to relax so that the ventricles can refill with blood. Okay? Because tetany is not possible. They're allowing the muscle to relax. Ventricular muscle has time to relax ventricles. Fill with blood during diastole. So no matter how fast your heart is beating, there's always a period of diastole because of the extended refractory period. If um, if tetany was possible and you could stay in a state of contraction. You would be in a constant state of systole, and the heart could never refill with blood. Okay. So let's kind of go through the thought process. So how does a long, how does a longer refractory period prevent tension? So I kind of have part of the answer here. Think, let's think what we just did. How does a longer absolute refractory period of So, my first thought is, you know, with a longer refractory period, the ventricular muscle has time to relax because you can't re-stimulate. So as long as you kind of understand that concept and you tie that sentence, if you can't re-stimulate it, then, therefore, it follows, the ventricular muscle has time to relax, okay, and it can't be re-stimulated, therefore, the ventricles 
that dealt with blood during diastole. Um, now, when we talked about diastole, we said that the whole cardiac cycle is the 0.8 seconds. How long was the systole? 0.3. The diastole is typically 0.5. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. You know, make the connection. That, that, that's why we spend all that time talking about uh, delays with polarization. And we always like students to look at slides like this. So having looked at it, I mean, could you just choose which one's the cardiac muscle? A or B? Yeah, it is kind of what you see there, the long range potential. For example, right here, um, if I threw these numbers at you, approximate the refractory period for cardiac and skeletal muscle. I mean, which one makes sense based on our discussion here? Which of these choices? That one, not that one. This one does. Yeah, D, D does. Double check for understanding. I mean, this is kind of like, okay, well, of these two, it's cardiac muscle. As long as you Hammer that point in your head for that part of the test, um, you're going to be okay. Now, I want to switch gears now. Do you have any questions about refractory period? I want to talk about the auto witness cells now. Okay. All right, so the concept of pacemaker activity is that there's spontaneous depolarization. Now, any cardiac cell with pacemaker potential can initiate the heart to beat. Now, I defined three of them. One is SA node, one is AB node, and I said Purkinje was the third. All of you saw it in your heart, right? All of you, you all did that one. Which is the number one pacemaker? SA. SA. That establishes the normal sinus rhythm. That's what I want to take a look at. Okay, so this frame has three frames, and they're trying to show you the same thing but different features in each one for this action potential. So let's recap that. So it looks like they got no volts versus time. They put threshold at negative 40. That's our threshold potential. And it looks like they start at a pace of negative 60. For this one, they define the two potentials, pacemaker versus action. So we talked about that earlier. You start here and you slowly depolarize the threshold. So just that right there is the pacemaker potential. And what caused the polarization? What carried the current? Remember I used red? Calcium. Calcium is, is different for the other one. Yeah. It was sodium for the muscle cell, but for the autoimmune cell is calcium. So that's what they show you here. This middle frame, the ionic current, you get a net sodium in for the pacemaker potential. But you need to get a net calcium in for the depolarization. Is there any delay in repolarization? No. What causes the repolarization? Calcium. Potassium out, and that's what they show there, the ionic currents. I think I used the moon. you repolarize back to negative 60. Now another term that's used here, once you get to negative 60, once you repolarize, hyperpolarize, you don't stay there. There's these uh, funny currents caused by funny channels. See this right here? And they call them funny because they notice that, huh, they, they always open when the cell is hyperpolarized. So that means current in, in physiology. So I F, we're going to call that funny current. They're also called HCN channels. The, the 
H stands for hyperpolarization. So basically, these channels open when the cell is in a state of hyperpolarization. Channels open. cells are in hyperpolarization. And we know that when they open, the current is carried primarily by sodium. So you, you don't stay at rest, you just kind of immediately go back and you polarize the threshold. So that's why they say funny channels open. Okay, also calcium plays a role. Some calcium channels open when you begin to reach threshold. And that allows lots of calcium channels to open there too. So you got the potentials, you got the what carries the current, and you have which channels are opening. So that funny channels is, is the new thing to add. It is basically responsible for the pacemaker potential. That sodium, those sodium currents carry by funny channels. And if I use the term HCM on, on the test, it's, I use that term too. But anyways, that, that is the most important thing about the autorhythmic cells. pacemaker ability. Okay, you can just slowly depolarize the threshold all by yourself. So that's the figure from another book. This is the figure from your textbook, but it's, uh, the information is not different. Um, but I thought it would be good um, for students to kind of like figure out for these categories how they're different for this cell versus that cell. Make a potential. Depolarization plateau. Repolarization tension. You just kind of know the differences for. Contractile cells versus autoimmune. For the pacemaker potential, which cell had it? Only one of them did. Autoimmune. I'll just put a check. It's got the pacemaker potential. It doesn't exist in tractile. They just went straight from rest to depolarization. So I'll just put an X. That happened. Now for the depolarization, they both had it, but it was carried by different currents. For contractile cells, it was carried by sodium. Or was it for the autoimmune cells? Calcium. Now you have this delay of repolarization for one of these cell types. Which one was it? Autorhythmic. This, this had it, okay? You kind of delayed the repolarization. It made the action potential duration very long, okay? This one doesn't have it. Uh, oh, wait, I'm sorry, I tripped on the wrong one. This one has it, has it. Oh my gosh. Wait, no, wait. Yes. <laughs> that one has it, this one does not. They got that straight. Okay. Of course, they both repolarize, and it's carried by the same current, efflux of potassium. Okay, now 
you tell me which cell type generates tension? Contractile. So this generates the tension. This does not, but it is very efficient at spreading the signal throughout the whole heart. Okay, that's what we talked about yesterday with the ECG. But no tension is generated. So um, you can modify the autorhythmic cells, and they call that the accelerator and the brakes with parasympathetic sympathetic activity. A picture of that. They show, well, they use green to symbolize the sympathetic activity on the SA and the AB node. There's also a um, that's directed to adrenergic receptors on the cardiac muscle itself. And the vagus nerve has parasympathetic activity on the SA and the AB node. So you can modify it. So now let's talk about autorhythmic cells. So these determine the heart rate. I was kind of drawing this for the autorhythmic cells. The connection I want you to make was this length of time, however long it takes you to reach threshold, that's your heart rate. That will determine your heart rate because what does one of these determine? Well, if the SA node is firing, the signal spreads through the whole heart and you get one cardiac cycle. So that's why this slow depolarization of the threshold, that amount of time to fire an action potential is so important. So what I'm saying is you can modify this. What if it looks like this? Is that going to be a faster or slower heart rate? Faster. Faster. Mm. Sympathetics can do that. Call that the accelerator. Well, I'm exaggerating, but I mean that would be parasympathetic, the brakes. So that's shown here. Okay, these, these figures kind of do a good job showing it. Uh, the top frame, normal sinus rhythm, the condition of rest. But, you know, let's say you relax, lie down, play soft music, you know, um, biologically slow your heart rate down. The effect of catecholamine is you start from a more negative potential that requires more time to reach threshold. So this is the brakes. Let me uh, list the details here. acetylcholine is you go past it you open more potassium channels so you hyperpolarize more so this is parasympathetic activity the effects on ACH one you open more potassium channels or yes open more So therefore, you increase the hyperpolarization. So I like how they show on the figure, they color in the area under the threshold purple. So they color a darker purple to tell you that you've increased the hyperpolarization. Increase. Hyperpolarization. You basically start more negative in terms of memory potential. I'll just say start more negative. So that's one thing.
The other effect is you kind of close more of calcium channels. It takes longer to reach threshold that way. So if a normal slope would be kind of like that, if it's taking longer to reach threshold because more calcium channels are closed, it might be like less steep. So it might take you a longer amount of time. Um, I don't know if I drew that well, but I'm trying to show you that. If one is more steep, this is supposed to be less steep. Instead of reaching threshold this long, it takes you much longer. That's all I was trying to show you. So uh, more hyperpolarized. Take longer to reach threshold. That's the main thing to understand. That's why your heart rate slows down. Now the reverse is true for the accelerator. So just look at the picture and kind of see what's happening. Catecholamines, what has the reverse effects? The funny channels, they open earlier, and that's going to decrease the hyperpolarization. So you start from a less negative potential, and basically, you're going to open calcium channels more. So the sympathetic, the accelerator. Catecholamines, remember I called them epi and norepi. And, um, all right, so, number one, open the funny channel sooner. So you're starting, instead of starting from negative 60, maybe you're starting from like negative 40. Um, so you're basically, they, they call it reduced polarization. There's a shorter distance to threshold, basically. Another thing you do is open more calcium. So you're increasing the slope. They call it more rapid depolarization. I'll use, I'll use their terms. That's the, kind of like the cell physiology there. Reduce repolarization, more rapid depolarization. In the end, a faster heart rate. Okay. Well, we're going to do a lab today, and um, not quite there yet, but there's one part where you might have to lie down, and we're going to have to figure out, um, you're going to have to figure that out. What is the subject going to lie down in this room? Um, that is part of it. But then, your subject's going to have to exercise. I did warn you about that. Right? Okay. What's lie down supposed to do to heart rate? It should, it should slow down a little bit. Although, in this environment, it's kind of hard to do. It's not a four-star hotel. But um, definitely exercise, you should jump in heart rate. And um, so when you put all the frames next to each other, it, it, it's really easy to see. Which one's the normal sinus rhythm? Hey, yeah. Which one's parasympathetic? B. If you know what you're looking for, it, it's quite easy to answer that question. Well, let's take a break. Uh, come back and let's say 9.25. About 15 minute break.